Call of Duty has finally addressed skill-based matchmaking. They tease that they're going to do this late last year in a tweet, and that day has finally come because they put out a blog explaining exactly how all of their skill-based matchmaking works. And at the top of this blog, they put out a diagram showing all the key factors that go into how their matchmaking works. And at the very top of that, and what they say is the most important part, is connection. What they're claiming here is that they prioritize ping over everything else in the game, which I do have to give them credit for. As you can see at the top left of the screen, I have a 15 millisecond response time right now. That is my ping to the server. The very next thing is the time to match. They want to get players in the game as fast as possible. They don't want people waiting around trying to get into their games, sitting at the menu, loading in. But then after connection in your time to match, the things they really look into is the playlist diversity. So obviously it's going to match you against players who are playing within the same playlist. We all know this. But it also looks at your recent maps in modes that you've played. So whether or not you've been queuing into like shipment 24 7 if they see you like smaller maps or things like that they'll take that into account if they see that you only like playing maybe domination or hard point or if you're more of a a tdm kind of guy they try to pair you with players that more favor those modes but underneath all that your connection your time to game and what you pick to play then comes in the skill-based matchmaking that is the next heavily heavily looked at factor we're putting you with players and this seems a little obvious but the way they measure your skill is they look at your kills your deaths your recent performances your wins and your losses and from what they claim they've been using this kind of system and just improving upon it since call of duty 4 all the way back in 2007. now i know a lot of people that would disagree with that and say that the older call of duties have not had skill-based matchmaking either that or it's been a lot less strict and honestly, I'd have to agree. I personally have always been pretty ass at Call of Duty, but I feel like back in the day, I, I could at least have a few lobbies here and there where I'm absolutely just destroying people that look like they've never touched a controller in their life. And that brings me into my next point, because another thing they look at while matching you with other players is your input device. Whether or not you're playing on keyboard and mouse or controller, it tries to pair you with people of similar skill level mainly with the same input device i would think but i'll grab a screenshot from the start of this game in the pre-game lobby showing all the input devices and we'll see just how close that is because i know i've played plenty of games against people on controller i personally mainly play on keyboard and mouse myself so i do get lobbies with people that do play on keyboard and mouse but i feel like i run into a lot of controller players as well so i don't know how heavily the input weighs into it but to me it kind of seems random and of course along with your input device it does take into account what platform you're playing on whether it's playstation xbox or pc i'm pretty sure it even takes into account whether or not you're playing on steam or battlenet the two different ways to play on pc and i'm assuming it matches you with players playing on the same platform as you because i don't know anything about matchmaking or, or infrastructure and when it comes to setting up servers and stuff for a game but I feel like players within the same platform probably connect better to people. And oddly enough, another thing they look at is whether or not you have voice chat enabled or disabled. I play with voice chat disabled a lot of the time, just because when I make content on it, sometimes like people talking can like throw me off my train of thought, or I'm scared that I'll start doing my like voiceover commentary in the game chat. Or you, you know how COD lobbies get and people can just start saying, you know, all the most random, absurd, obscene shit out there. So most of the time, I just don't deal with it unless I'm playing like ranked or like Warzone or something like that. But it doesn't say whether or not if you have voice chat enabled, if it positively or negatively affects your matchmaking experience. I think personally, it'll probably just match you with players that don't use voice chat as often. Like since I always have it disabled, it probably puts me with people that also have it disabled or just don't use voice chat a whole lot. But if you are using voice chat a lot or like the text features, I'm pretty sure play into it as well that it'll probably pair you with other people that like to chirp on the mic as well. And something they really made a note of is that backing out of matches actually can affect your SBMM as well. And I don't mean like you're getting your ass kicked in a game and you back out of it. I think that definitely plays into a factor of whether or not like who they're queuing you with. But if you're going into a game mode and you see a map that you don't like and you back out trying to look for a different map, that plays into your SBMM as well. Their example for this is when Rust was out, the shipment Rust playlist is that a lot of players would get the map rust they wouldn't want it so they would they would back out trying to get shipment and they said that this decreases your time to match overall affecting how they match you with players which i mean i get but sometimes like why don't you just put out uh, some playlists that people want to play all the maps on like we just had uh like an mw2 mosh pit come out recently and it had maps like los almas it had shoot house it had some of the, some of the better maps from mw2 but then they throw it in crown raceway as well 
Now, I personally don't like that map a whole lot. So if I were on that playlist, I would have backed out of Crown Raceway unless I was going for something like long shots, which is another reason people might back out of a map. Like, like if you're going for a certain challenge and you're given a map where that challenge is impossible on, like you keep getting a shipment when you're trying to get long shots on Rustman. Like it could be the, the reverse. So I think what they're trying to say with this is to try not to back out of lobbies before you're actually in them because it makes it harder for them to find you an actual lobby that's going to be good for you. But I don't care what they say. I'm still going to do it because if I'm looking for a certain map, I'm going to get that certain map. And the main thing that they should be looking at here is that they should always have a shipment 24-7 playlist if people really back out of the shipment x whatever map playlist so much just to find it and this is our overall performance for this game if we're uh, really looking into our sbmm i went 42 and 38 with 26 confirms and we won the game so we'll see if our next game's any worse there's also part of this blog where they try to address a lot of the questions they frequently get from the community and a lot of people's like theories on sbmm and try to put them to rest and for a while there's a theory out there where people thought that your sbmm could affect your hit detection like whether or not you were getting hit or if you could hit people effectively. Same with player visibility and if aim assist was better for certain people than others. And in this, they they basically say that that's not the case. Now, I know a lot of the, the tinfoil hat people out there are going to still say that this happens. And, you know, I'm all down to throw out an excuse whenever I'm getting shit on to why it's not my fault. But honestly, I, I can see it. I can believe it. I really don't think that they're going to be boosting people's aim assist or hit detection or things like that because even if they were, if some dev or something leaked that that was actually happening, that would be disastrous for Call of Duty. But I mean, believe whatever you want to believe. I'm not here to tell you what's real and what's not, whatever helps you sleep at night. But according to them, they don't do any of that shit. There's also a theory going around if you spend a certain amount of money or the more money you spend on the game, the easier your lobbies will be and they claim that that's not true. It would be pretty crazy, but I feel like I've spent a good amount of money on COD throughout the years, uh, especially since I've been making content on it. I, I bought my fair share of bundles, but uh, I don't think I've ever had like an insanely easy lobby. I feel like no matter where, what lobby I am, or how I'm playing, I am either going even or negative. I, I barely go positive on anything. And people always say, why don't they just have an option to not have skill-based matchmaking? Like, if you want to play skill-based, like, maybe they have a ranked mode or have, uh, like, a casual mode where they use skill-based matchmaking like they do now. And then just have another mode where none of that is enabled. Kind of like you're able to opt in or opt out of using skill-based matchmaking. And in their own words, they say overall, data suggests that splitting our player base with an opt-in, opt-out matchmaking system will have negative consequences on the overall player pool. And they say that'll lead to longer wait times for matches and matches with worse connections. And I don't know if that's necessarily true. I haven't done any data research on it, but basically every single person that I've seen that plays Call of Duty Multi player has said that they would prefer to have lobbies that aren't skill based determined like you can still have matches and lobbies that place you with players that are close by you so you can have your your ping is king your 30 millisecond latency while also not going against players that are absolutely going to beat the shit out of you every time you play but at the same time i'm just asked so maybe if i sat here and used my brain for a few seconds i'd have some higher kill games instead of just running right at people shooting hoping to get a kill and the last theory from the community that they addressed is that content creators or call of duty partners get easier or more favorable lobbies than other people and now this could be just because i'm a smaller call of duty youtuber and i don't play multiplayer as much but personally i have never gotten one decent lobby just for making videos on the game i've been very critical of the game in years past i've never been told what to say by call of duty and i don't even think they know that i exist but even if they did they're putting me in some pretty shitty content creator lobbies because i have been getting my ass kicked for the longest time but maybe just to spite me they put me in a creator lobby here i had 58 kills and 63 deaths maybe not still one though and just in case you want to see my overall multiplayer stats here they're kind of abysmal i only have a 0.98 kd ratio i only win my games 0.81 percent of the time and i've played 270 games i have a total of 7770 kills oh it's not gonna let me look at it now and more than that deaths but one little glimmer of hope towards the very end of this vlog is uh they put a little question saying have you ever considered removing skill from matchmaking in specific general multiplayer game modes and they said we have considered in the past and we will continue to examine if this idea makes sense on part of an experimental playlist or in specific modes but we have nothing to announce from that front today so it seems like maybe in the future 
we could have some sort of experimental playlist like we saw earlier in the year where they were trying out different visibility things and, and movement speeds where they do another experimental playlist where we see only ping based but no skill based which i think a lot of players would be happy with even i think them just putting it in the title of the playlist and keeping it the same way people still might be happy with it it might be a little placebo effect but that's basically everything that they revealed about skill based matchmaking in this little blog uh, it's, it's a lot of stuff that we already knew they kind of went a little more in depth on some other things like i had no idea voice chat had anything to do with it or the way that you back out of lobbies looking for other maps things like that i always thought weapons had something to do with because it always seems like whatever weapon i'm using i seem to run into a lot more people using that same weapon as well like if i start using a melee weapon i seem to be getting in lobbies where people are using melees more if i'm working on launcher camos all of a sudden i'm in lobbies where everybody's using launchers so I'm, I'm thinking some things have been omitted that way players don't try to like take advantage of the system and be like oh if i use this specific thing or i play a very specific way then i can get lobbies that i want but at the same time reverse boosting is a thing so people can just hop into games and play like ass for like an hour and then hop on and have a, a lobby or two where they can go drop like 900 kills but i don't think they've said anything too groundbreaking in this blog it hasn't been anything that's going to be like world shattering but at least they're they're speaking about it whether or not you believe what they're saying and now that we've made it through all the sbmm talk it's time for everybody's favorite segment gamer guy does sports talk and uh yesterday the lions season unfortunately came to an end we lost in the nfc championship to the san francisco 49ers Overall, it's a pretty good game, but uh, we lost in a very heartbreaking fashion. You know, per the MO for the Lions. We, we really started off playing very, very well. We came out hot. We scored on our first drive. We're, we're going crazy. We're stacking on points. And we went into halftime winning like 24 to 10. And after that, it's like the, the team didn't want to show up. And we made so many mistakes everywhere. But a, a lot of what I'm seeing is people putting the, the blame on the loss on, on Dan Campbell's decision, our, our head coach, to go for it on fourth down multiple times instead of kicking field goals. But I feel like those people don't really watch a whole lot of Lions football. So our, our whole team's identity is like, fuck you, we're going to we're going to go for it on fourth down. We're going to take these risks and we're, we're going to try to make these things happen. What we're not known for is kicking field goals over 40 plus yards. Because on those fourth down attempts, at least on, on the one near the goal line where we were like inching our way in to score, our, our drive just stalled out and we had that decision to make. And Goff made a pretty good pass. He, he threw it to Josh Reynolds, who was there and was open, and he just couldn't hang on to the ball. And that was one of two really bad drops that Reynolds had this game. And I ain't going to be too mad at him. Obviously, you got to make the play when it's there. Like, we can't leave opportunities on the table like that, especially in a game that big. Because he was basically, like, automatic for us early into the season where I'm pretty sure most of his catches throughout the first few weeks of the season were all for, like, first downs or touchdowns. Like, he was, he was lighting it up. And it just so happened that he had his, like, worst mistakes of the season at the worst possible time in the, the game that means the most because that drop on fourth down really started like the the momentum shift into the 49ers favor they marched right down the field and scored uh there was an insane play which really fucking sucked for for me but a as a football fan i can see I, I can detach myself from my lions fandom and be like that was a sweet play but brock purdy like threw threw up a, a ball that was a bit overthrown to Brandon Ayuk down the field. And it literally bounced off the face mask of, of one of our DBs. And somehow, someway, Brandon Ayuk came down with the ball at like the four yard line. And then it didn't take him long to score from there. It was like a, a play or two later that like Christian McCaffrey punched it in. Oh no, it actually was Ayuk that punched it in. And that just really like started the, the avalanche of points that they were going to score on us. Because on our, our first possession back after they uh, you scored that touchdown after the insane grab, uh, on our first play, our, our running back, Jameer Gibbs, fumbled the ball, which is very uncharacteristic from him. I don't think he's had, like, really any fumbles this year, at least not that I can think of. Maybe, like, one or two. But on, on the first play of a drive fumbling a ball, that's just terrible. Especially with us being on our own 25-yard line. The Niners just marched down the field and scored. 
and now they have a very small amount of the field to go to score again. So just within like a blink of an eye, they scored 14 points and they were like raging coming back. At this point, we only had like a three point lead and then we just couldn't get anything done. I think on every possession the Niners had the whole second half, they scored on every single possession. On all of our possessions, we either turned the ball over, punted, or just didn't get anything done on offense. But on one of the drives where we didn't get anything done, we had a really nice punt. Jack Fox fucking aired it out with his foot. He booted that thing basically the entire length of the field and there was an opportunity to stop the ball on the one yard line, you know, pin them back in their own end zone and maybe give us a, a chance here to force a three and out or maybe even get a safety. But somebody on the punt team tried to make the play and stop it on the one yard line, but their, their foot was over the line into the end zone. So it was a touchback which set them at like the, the 20 yard line or the 25, whatever the fuck it is for punts now. What I'm trying to say is that those going forward on those two fourth downs wasn't a, a make or break it for the game. Yeah, it would have been nice to have, you know, six extra points if we would have kicked those field goals, but we really were not making any field goals over 40 yards in a dome that we play in. So outside, I know it wasn't like very windy, but it can still have an effect on the ball in our kicker Badgley has been very very good within like 30 yards but from 40 plus we had a better statistical chance to make it on fourth down like we went for it i, I saw a stat saying that the lines went for it 24 times on fourth down this season and we converted like 19 out of those 24 times and for our 40 plus yard field goals i think we attempted like 10 of those this year and we made three of them so i understand the decision of going for it on fourth and we could have had it it's just the, the play wasn't there when we went to make it we, we just left a lot of points on the board and later in the game you know after the niners had started rallying and they started scoring we had a play on offense where we ran a, a flea flicker and Goff had JMO wide open. He was, he was, he had like at least a step or two on the defender and probably could have scored off of it, but just barely missed him. There was a few deep balls where it felt like Goff either just barely under through or, or over through the receiver. And those could have been game changers. And, and the worst part about losing like that and losing by three points is that we are so close to the Super Bowl, man. The Lions have never been to the Super Bowl. This is our chance. This is our year that we could have gone in. I don't think we're ever going to have uh, a more optimal like path to the Super Bowl. Like we started out our year hot. We were doing pretty well. Uh, all the teams in our division were it took a bit to like get going and we lucked out by having like Kirk Cousins get hurt. So we didn't have to go against like one of the better quarterbacks in the league even though we still had their like backup quarterback throw all over us every time we played against them. We got pretty lucky earlier in the year where the Packers are still figuring things out and Jordan Love didn't quite have his, his footing yet. But now it looks like they're going to be a force to be reckoned with in the division yet again. And then now the Bears, they weren't doing very well at the start of the year, but towards the end, it's like they, they really started getting things going. Their defense looked really solid and their offense was figuring things out and Justin Fields was always having a good game against us. I don't know if he'll be there at quarterback for them next year, but they do have the first overall pick in like another top 10 pick. So they, they have all the tools and all the everything they need to, to build a, a good team and be competitive. And I think the NFC North, our division, is going to be one of the harder divisions in football next year. And we're going to have a, a pretty rough schedule since we won the division this year. Because division leaders will go against all the other division leaders the, the following year. They're going to give us a tougher competition to go against. Which I'm all for, because if you can't beat the good teams, then, like, you're not going to win anything. But it just really sucks, because some teams, they don't make it back to games like that. Like, yeah, we were in the NFC Championship this year, and we did very, very well, but there's no guarantees we'll be back. And even our, our coach did a, a little, like, media session and saying this the same exact thing. Like, nothing's guaranteed. Like, a few years ago when the Rams won the Super Bowl, they looked unstoppable, and people thought they were going to go repeat. And then like injuries piled up and things just weren't clicking and it was like uh, the classic Super Bowl hangover where the, the Rams didn't even make the playoffs the following year. And then they, they made it this year. They looked really good and just so happened we played them and barely beat them in that game. And we didn't really score any points in the second half there. But it's just like nothing is guaranteed and you just got to take the chances when you got them. And it just sucks that we couldn't get it here. Holy shit. This is even worse. I went 66 and 91. Holy fuck. But overall, it was a very good season. I think if you would have told me, like, before it started, that the Lions were to be in the NFC Championship, I would have been thrilled. 
and I still am. Like, it was still great. I, I love to see my team get that far. It's the farthest I've ever seen the Lions get in my life. I just hope that it, this isn't it. Because we have a very good team. We have a very good roster. Not everybody's going to be back. You know, the, we're going to be losing some people in the offseason, signing some new people in the offseason, and like how every year goes. But I just hope they can keep up how they've been playing. I hope that this doesn't just like kill the team. So I'm fully behind Dan Campbell. He's the reason we got there in the first place. He completely changed this team around him and uh, our, our owner, Sheila Hamp. Sheila Fordhamp and Brad Holmes, our, our general manager, having like insane drafts. So I think we'll be okay, but it's just hard to be so close yet so far away. And another big hit to this is that we're probably losing our offensive coordinator who completely revitalized like the way we play ball. Like our offense is one of the top in the league and he's probably gone. He's going to be taking like a head coaching job, I think in like Washington or something. But maybe it's a good thing because for whatever reason, all season, we could not do anything in mainly the, the, the second half, but mainly the third quarter. Like people called it the third quarter because we would just fall apart. We would start out hot, do really, really well in multiple games throughout the season, right at the start of the game. And then it's like after halftime, everybody lost their momentum, their, their energy and just could not get the same things done because everyone always says something about like halftime adjustments and like coaches like making like schematic changes during halftime and that's like what makes and breaks games but honestly i don't think there's really a whole lot you can do within those like what is it 30 20 30 minutes of of halftime i think you can probably you know make a few fits a few fixes to certain like Schemes like if a, a team is running a lot of like the same run play then you're like, okay uh, We can start running this stunt here or like filling in this gap and that can block it I don't think you can completely change your game plan with within halftime But sometimes just that little break and you know being able, like sending the players to the locker room and having your foot off the gas Is enough to like kill momentum for a team and it seems like that happened to us a lot. And if I were to end this on a positive note for the Lions, at least Jamison Williams kind of had his breakout game in that NFC Championship. He didn't have like a crazy, like any crazy statistics or anything. Like he wasn't getting like a 200 yards, but he had 75 yards receiving and he had a rushing touchdown. At least I think it counts as a rushing touchdown. It was kind of like an end around that he got the ball on the very first touchdown of the game. And then he, he had a like a lot of good like contested grabs. He was actually like a... A big part of our offense were in like some other weeks. It seemed like he was only getting targeted like one or two times and it was always just on like a, a fly ball. We weren't really running any like crossing routes with him and trying to get him into like open field where he can just absolutely like, outrun people. But it seemed like it all clicked and they put a lot of trust in him in this game. And for the most part, he followed through and he had that our, our very last touchdown of the game. He, he had that touchdown catch. So at least after a bit, after, you know, he was hurt for most of his first year and then suspended for a bit of this year, it, it seems like he's finally getting up to speed and doing pretty well. And actually, one more thing before I forget. I, I will say one thing you can criticize Dan Campbell for, or you can put this on Ben Johnson. I don't know who made the call. But while we were trailing down, what was it? I don't even know how many points. We were down 10 points, I think towards the end of the game with like a minute 30 left. I don't know whose decision it was to try to run the ball like on the one yard line. In a, in a position like that where the clock is like really a factor, you don't want to run the ball at all. You want to try to pass the ball because uh, if it's incomplete, at, at least the clock stops or like a receiver can try to get out of bounds. You can run all kinds of routes towards like the sideline to get out of bounds to stop the clock. But running the ball there, knowing that you'd have to burn a timeout, really kind of just like I, it, it was the last nail in the coffin because even though we did score like a play or two later and cut the lead down to three points there was really no chance of us winning unless we recovered the onside kick because they just need to run two plays and that's basically it because if we have all three timeouts all we had to do was like make a stop on defense if we stopped them for three plays they'd have to punt us the ball and we'd have to try to get down the field with like i don't know 30 seconds left and no timeouts after that but going in with only two timeouts trying to get the ball back it's it's almost impossible they'd have to make a, a crucial mistake and they were not doing that all they did the whole game was capitalize on our terrible mistakes but now that we have a team that has like deep playoff experience and we've we've gone through things like this i hope that this just helps us grow and we become a better team for it and i'm i'm hoping that this isn't our, our super bowl our championship window closing and maybe it's this it's just opening but i guess 
time will tell and hopefully we can make it back there and honestly at this point i hope the 49ers win the super bowl so at least we can say we lost to the super bowl champions and it'd be cool to see brock purdy uh win it all going from mr irrelevant the last pick in the draft to a super bowl champion within two years pretty cool story and i'd rather not see the chiefs win another one and damn 71 and 75 i just cannot escape death but that's about all i got for you guys today just wanted to talk a bit about what they put out with sbmm and fill you guys in on my thoughts on uh, the lions end of the season but thank you guys for watching i truly appreciate all your love and support and i will see you in the next one later